Hi guys, uh, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number five. So let's get started. So firstly, today is World Brain Tumor Day, June 8th, and that's why I've included this question. So let's read question number one, okay? So first, a 48 year old female presents with several month history of persistent headaches. Her husband notes that over the past few months, the patient has seemed apathetic and depressed. Imaging revealed a solitary, well-circumscribed, space-occupying lesion along the left cerebral convexity. Surgery is performed, revealing a solitary tumor that is easily separated from the underlying brain. A biopsy of the tumor is shown here. This is a biopsy. So what could be the answer? A. Medulloblastoma B. Meningioma C. Glioblastoma multiforme and D. Pilocytic astrocytoma So pause, try to answer and we'll discuss. Yeah, so firstly, a 48 year old female presents with several months of head headache, persistent headaches, and there is some behavioral changes, little bit of depression in the patient. They have not told anything about focal neurological deficits. So firstly, let's look at it. A middle-aged woman coming with a few months or several months of persistent headache, always there, probably not relieved with medication. So when you see such a, such a picture with some behavioral changes or maybe even some focal neurological picture you should start thinking that it could be a space occupying lesion probably a brain tumor also considering the age could more likely to be a brain tumor so remember one of the most common features of brain tumors or any space occupying lesion is a persistent headache not relieved on usual analgesic medication you could have new onset seizures which is not there in this patient but any adult coming with new onset seizures, definitely you have to do imaging studies or behavioral changes or some focal deficits like speaking difficulties, weakness, sudden onset weakness or gradual weakness. Any of these focal deficits, if you notice, you should always image for a or you should always call for a imaging study. So headache with any of these, even just persistent headache, you could call. But headache with any of these features is a red flag sign to call for an imaging study. So. The doctor in this case has done the right thing. He sent for imaging. Uh, we don't know what. Again, the gold standard when you're suspecting a tumor or a space occupying lesion is MRI. So he sent for an imaging study which revealed a well circumscribed space occupying lesion. So well circumscribed means it's probably not a malignant lesion. Okay. Space occupying along the left cerebral convexity. So it's along the convexity somewhere here. Okay. So surgery is performed. Okay, so they have also done the surgery, which revealed a solitary tumor. Okay, one tumor that is easily separated from the underlying brain. This is an important point. And the biopsy of the tumor was shown here. So just from the history, even without looking at the picture, you can solve this question. Same way, just from the picture, without even looking at the history, you can also solve this question. So firstly, after reading all this, we know that it's probably a malignant tumor in this patient and now we look at the picture so this picture is very classical of a certain pathology which we will discuss so first we we'll go through the options so a medulloblastoma b meningioma c gbm and d pilocytic astroma so let's start from the bottom now so pilocytic astrocytoma if we remember the who grading for astrocytoma is grade one astrocytoma okay so pilocytic astroma is astrocytoma is grade one astrocytoma and it's commonly seen in children right it's a tumor which is mainly seen in children can be seen in adults but mainly seen in children so probably this is not the answer next gbm it's grade 4 if you remember the who classification of astrocytoma gbm is grade 4 astrocytoma so grade 1 is juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma grade 2 is fibrillary astrocytoma grade 3 is anaplastic astrocytoma and grade grade 4 is the most dangerous one glioblastoma multiforme so that is more of a very malignant tumor whereas in this history this looks more more like a benign tumor but we can keep that in mind but as of now we'll just mark it off meningioma yes this looks most like a meningioma solitary tumor most important point is easily separated from the underlying brain so there are two kinds of masses extra axial masses and intra axial masses so intra axial is what comes from within the brain parenchyma and this these kind of masses 
are very difficult to separate from the brain whereas extra axial masses are present outside the brain parenchyma and even compress the brain parenchyma so in this case we know that it's easily separated from the surface of the underlying brain so it is a extra axial mass so therefore both gbm and pilocytic astrocytoma arise from the brain tissue astrocytoma is a malignancy of the astrocytes which are supporting cells of the brain so definitely they are interaxial ruled out medulloblastoma again is more common in children it's a it's a, a malignancy of, or a tumor of childhood and it is interaxial so this is also ruled out so therefore meningioma is the answer so in this discussion both meningioma and astrocytoma are frequently asked questions we spoke about the who grade 1 2 3 and 4 of astrocytoma starting from junior pilocytic to gbm so this is a very classical picture of meningioma now let's look at the histology you can see this world patterns okay world patterns all over here and world patterns are classical of meningioma and you can see these basophilic or purple color concentric bodies or right? round purple color bodies these are nothing but your somoma bodies so let's get into a small discussion on uh, astrocyte uh, on meningioma which was the answer of the question so meningioma firstly is a mostly most in most cases very rarely malignant but in most cases a benign tumor okay a benign tumor seen from the second to the sixth decade of life here the patient was 48 year old so ideal candidate more common slightly more common in females than men and its common sites of occurrence are first the cerebral convex cities very important then along the midline along the fox along the midline then even in the olfactory groove it can be seen other than this at any site including the spinal cord and uh, did i miss anything yeah and even uh, at the ventricles so again this is what meningioma is pathologically it arises so it arises from the arachnoid capsule so this is a doubt a lot of people have pia dura arachnoid, arachnoid many people place it as a origin from the dura but it is actually arises from the arachnoid cap cells so it's a tumor which arises from the arachnoid cap cells it's most likely benign seen from the second to sixth decade of life more slightly more common in females and the common sites are the uh, cerebral convexities lateral cerebral convexities like here you can see it's left cerebral convexity this is a ct image so cerebral convexities and sometimes also in the midline okay so these are the common sites other than that i already mentioned now coming to the features of this tumor it is usually a solitary tumor so there is only one usually solitary tumor if you see multiple meningiomas you should always suspect a von recklinghausen syndrome so remember multiple meningiomas in any clinical history or question they give in the exam multiple meningiomas always suspect von recklinghausen syndrome then it is a well since it's a benign it's usually a well circumscribed tumor that indents so this is an mri okay that indents the surrounding brain tissue and that's what causes the clinical features like weakness or headache or even behavioral changes because it indents the surrounding brain tissue and that can lose its function so it indents it arises from the arachnoid cap cells i already told you and they have, it is firmly adherent to the dural layer so it is firmly adherent to the dural layer and easily separated from the brain indents the brain extra axial mass okay so those were the gross features now coming to the microscopic features microscopic is also very classical they have a classical world like pattern like we showed in the picture earlier so these are the worlds and most importantly the somoma bodies which are nothing but concentric calcific bodies so they are basophilic that is purple in color concentric calcific bodies they represent dystrophic calcification okay so the cal calcium is deposited in this affected tissue so there are five other conditions where you see somoma bodies which you should by heart and remember so where all you if somoma body is part of the question or if you see something like this in your histological diagram given it should you know it should point you towards one of these five as a diagnosis so the first one is papillary carcinoma or papillary variant of the thyroid carcinoma so papillary thyroid carcinoma is one cause of somoma bodies the second condition where you see it is papillary 
renal cell carcinoma so papillary renal cell carcinoma so two papillaries third meningioma like we discussed now four is uh, mesothelioma so two ends two ends mesothelioma and the fifth one is in the ovary in the serous uh, cysts or serous malignancies of the ovary so these are five situations where you see some of my bodies and whether the histological diagram is given or it's part of the question in uh, in concern these five should be probably one of the answers so if it's a question about ovary and some of my bodies are seen if there are four options and one of them is serous cyst ovary you directly just mark that if it's a thyroid malignancy you have medullary papillary uh, lymphoma and all that as the options if you see a somoma body you can confidently mark papillary thyroid carcinoma as a question so that's why somoma bodies are important in all these cases again this is a ct image you can see well circumscribed mass compressing the brain tissue around it this is a cect actually so because it's so beautifully enhanced and this is an mri image again well circumscribed mass arising from the uh, du uh, dural layers the arachnoid and compressing the brain tissue okay again in the lateral convexities okay next question all are risk factors for pre eclampsia except a b c d a smoking b hyper placentosis c new paternity and d primary gravida few seconds yeah so this is an interesting question i have included and the answer here is smoking so we as ugs and while studying always remember smoking as a risk factor for everything and the examiners know this so they frequently ask questions like this and we don't even consider smoking while answering so the answer here is smoking and preeclampsia is one of those conditions in which smoking is protective okay so this is very important smoking is protective most of you including me would have marked c new paternity because it sounds weird but new paternity is a risk factor for preeclampsia so let's talk about where all smoking is protective because it's important to know this because any of these could be part of the question and you should know so remember smoking is these are the important ones smoking is protective in ulcerative colitis so rem uh, you know ulcerative colitis is a inflammatory bowel disease the other inflammatory bowel disease is crohn's and smoking is a risk factor for crohn's so remember smoking is a risk factor for crohn's but protective in ulcerative colitis next parkinson's disease it is protective in parkinson's disease it is protective in preeclampsia as we discussed now it is protective for uterine fibroids and endometrial ca so remember in obg you have three conditions where smoking is protective again the the protective benefits are far less than the danger so we don't advise smoking but yeah so three obg conditions preeclampsia uterine fibroids and endometrial ca so remember this is also important endometrial ca a malignancy which is protected by smoking very important so we consider smoking as a risk factor for all malignancies because of its uh, the oxidant stress that it creates but endometrial ca is one malignancy where smoking is protective preeclampsia uterine fibroids so three gynecologic conditions remember ulcerative colitis protective whereas crohn's it is a risk factor and parkinson's disease it is protective some new studies are coming up saying it's also protect protective for alzheimers because in parkinson's and alzheimers the way smoking helps is by reducing the uh, neurodegeneration by reducing the amount of uh, degenerated substance that settles in the brain too much details not necessary remember parkinson's disease is protected by smoking next question oh before that risk factors of preeclampsia we know this the most important here i want to highlight is previous history of preeclampsia is very important and it's the most important risk factor for preeclampsia other than that family history of preeclampsia and even hypertension placenta abnormalities hypocoagulable states like apla syndrome uh, protein c deficiency protein uh, s deficiency all the hypocoagulable states twin pregnancy mono pregnancy and this one don't forget new paternity we frequently question everyone thinks it sounds weird because new maternity is the answer but primary gravida is also a risk factor and new paternity is also a risk factor so new mother and new father both are risk factors okay last question contraindication to radical mastectomy is a pectoral is major involvement b distant metastasis c axillary lymph node involvement d all of the above two seconds yeah so very easy question nothing to really think here answer is distant metastasis so always remember when there is distant metastasis surgery is a rarely a option and that's why i have included this question the morb morbidity and mortality of doing a surgery when there is a distant metastasis is high and 
there is no point in doing the procedure because it's already metastasized so distinctly again pectoral is major involvement the question is radical mastectomy so remember pectoral is major is removed in radical mastectomy so this is ruled out axillary nodes are removed in radical mastectomy so yes you have to do it again obviously so distant metastasis if there is distant metastasis surgery is of very less use so now just to before we close up a few things about mastectomy very important for the exam and if you guys have have marrow please watch uh, dr rohan kandel wanser's videos on mastectomy very good uh, on breast in general very good even his surgery videos are very good but yeah so mastectomy let's talk about mastectomy there are three types of mastectomy simple mastectomy modified radical mastectomy and radical mastectomy we'll start from radical mastectomy because it was the first and it's not done anymore so radical mastectomy is also called halstead's mastectomy and we'll only limit our discussion to what is removed so in radical mastectomy we remove the breast the nipple areolar complex both the pectoral muscles and the pectoral fascia this is very important pectoral is major and pectoral is major Uh, and minor along with the pectoral fascia and level 1 2 and 3 of lymph node so breast nipple area complex uh, nipple area complex uh, pectoral is major pectoral is minor pectoral fascia and all three levels of axillary nodes which are in the breast so radical mastectomy is such a radical procedure you remove so many things now when it comes to modified uh, radical mastectomy what is the difference so you remove the breast same you remove the nipple area complex same pectoral fascia you remove but you do not remove the pectoral is major or minor here level 1 2 and 3 of axillary nodes are still removed so even in modified radical mastectomy all three level nodes are removed and plus or minus pectoral is minor so there are variations of modified radical mastectomy we won't get into that but in some variations pectoral is minor is removed in some variations pectoral is minor is left so what is the essential difference in radical and non radical it is that the pectoral major pectoral is major is removed in radical whereas so modified radical plus pectoral is major removal will give you radical mastectomy and sometimes minor is also not removed so that was modified and radical mastectomy now coming to the last one simple mastectomy here the breast nipple area complex and pectoral fascia are removed but the lymph nodes are not removed so the difference between simple and the radical procedures is that in simple no lymph nodes are removed this is very important remember it no lymph nodes removed in simple when do you do simple mastectomy in dcis ductal carcinoma in situ and phyllodes tumor in all other malignancies of the breast you do rad modified radical mastectomy or radical now radical is obsolete so only modified radical and only in ductal carcinoma in situ and phyllodes tumor you remove the simple mastectomy and what do you, or you do the simple mastectomy and what is the difference between simple mastectomy and the radical mastectomy lymph nodes are not removed in the simple mastectomy what is the difference between radical and modified radical pectoral muscles are the difference we discussed that lastly before we close up we'll just talk about the levels of nodes some of you might have been confused what the levels of nodes are very easy to remember first thing you have to remember is there are three levels of nodes second thing you have to remember is the pectoral is minor is the muscle that divides it into three levels of nodes so these are surgical divisions okay so it's just based on what a surgeon sees so it is the pectoral is minor which divides not the major but pectoral is minor which divides into 1 2 and 3 remember this is a question that's why i'm stressing on it so the level 1 nodes are the ones that are lateral to the pectoralis minor muscle so level 1 nodes are lateral to pectoralis minor muscle level 2 nodes lie below the pectoralis major muscle minor muscle minor and level 3 nodes lie medial to pectoralis minor muscle so pectoralis minor divides into three levels lateral level 1 me uh, under level 2 and medial level 3 so that's it for today thank you